I know the fear that you always have is like, am I going to be in one of those pictures? That's, it's like, I didn't sign up for this. Uh, am I going to be in one of those pictures? And uh, so hopefully you did get to enjoy uh, seeing yourself on there. Hey, as Adam mentioned, uh, we are in a new series called Chasing Jesus. You're going to hear us talk about that over the next uh, five weeks, including today. Very excited. A lot of it today, it's going to be a little bit unique, a little bit different. Um, we, um, we're, we're walking through the, kind of the mission and vision of our church. And so when people would ask like, hey, what's this church all about? What's Riverside all about? And you would be able to walk with them and tell them, hey, this is what we are about. And so I hope that after today, you can do that. And then after the five total weeks that you're going to even have a, um, a, a clue into what our discipleship distinctives are as well. These are the things that we put as prominent in our categories of things that we want to do and accomplish. We want people to encounter Jesus, grow together, discover purpose, and impact others. And we'll be walking through each of those uh, distinctives over the next couple of weeks. Um, but here's what I want you to do. Before we begin in this, I want you to imagine with me um, that you're about to embark on a journey. You've got your family, maybe you're going with friends, maybe you're going with colleagues or coworkers, but I, I want to throw a little twist into your trip. You have no GPS, you have no road signs, and you have no map. Now, I know some of you are like, I, Google Maps, what do you mean? I have my phone, I don't need anything else. No, there used to be these things that you would actually hold to tell you where you were going. You actually had to highlight um, before you would go on the trip so you knew the, the route that you were taking, right? There was no, oh, traffic is this way, turn right. You know, it's like you were. I was my parents' Google Maps. Like that was me for a long time, right? And so you're about to go on this destination that you have in your mind. Um, let's, let's just determine where we're going. We live in the mountains, so we're not gonna have the mountains versus beach. We clearly know the mountains are better. But let's say for this one, we're gonna go to the beach, right? So you, you've got your destination in mind. You're going to the beautiful beach on the other side of the country. You're enthusiastic, You've packed everything that you need for the journey. You're eager to get going on this journey. Um, you start driving, um, but you quickly realize something is wrong. <laughs> um, you make turns at random. <laughs> you really have no idea where you're going. You're, it's hard to find the right path to go on. You may be getting closer and closer to your destination, or you may not be. <laughs> Instead of heading east or west, you may be going south, and you have no idea, especially if you're traveling at night and have no clue. You ask for directions from strangers, but quite frankly, their advice is really conflicting and confusing. So you have no clue where to go. As time passes, frustration sets in. The journey becomes stressful and it becomes uncertain. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pause and I want you to consider this. Isn't this a lot like a spiritual journey when we're a part of a church that doesn't have a clear mission and vision of where you're going. You ask for directions. People are like, yeah, do this or do that or do this. And you have no idea. It's good. It's good advice, but it may be wrong. <laughs> it may not be the right thing at the right time. It may have worked for them, but it may not work for you. We're eager to follow and chase after Jesus, but maybe it's hard because without a roadmap, without a clear sense of where the church is going or heading, it's really easy to feel disoriented a little bit. And so today, as we kind of explore the importance of knowing the church's mission and vision, as we chase after Jesus, and, and I want you to know this, some of you, maybe you're newer to the area, you have no idea, that's actually a, a picture of Denver in the background of chasing Jesus. That's the Denver proper kind of outline, right? We're, we're kind of, we're right by the H. We're on the right side of the H right now. And did you know that in this city, God is already working. God is already working out in the city, and guess what? We get to actually go and join in the activity of God in the city. And so when we say chasing Jesus, we say that these are our mission and our vision and the distinctives that we adhere to because we're chasing after Jesus in our city to make his name known and to see people's lives transformed in their journey of faith and to make sure that it's meaningful and purposeful. So you're gonna hear us say that kind of chasing Jesus language a lot over the next five weeks, and it means that we are chasing after the work that God is already doing in this city. The, the kind of premier passage that I think of when this happens is out of Acts chapter 18. And in Acts chapter 18, verse nine and 10, you have Paul, 
And, and Paul is, this is, this is where he is starting the Corinthian church. That's so what I love about Acts is you can go back and see all of the churches that Paul begins and see what happens as he's starting those. You know, we just turn to Corinthians and we just read letters that he wrote. But in Acts, we get to see him going on this journey. And as he is going on this journey to start this church in Corinth, you have new people stepping into a relationship with Jesus. Guess what? Before he got there, it wasn't that they stepped into a relationship with Jesus because of Paul. It's because Paul was stepping into what God was already doing in their lives and they came to be followers of Christ. Because Paul was chasing after Jesus in those cities. And in Acts chapter 18, verse 9 and 10, one night, Paul gets this vision from God. He's talking to him. You, you could probably imagine that Paul's probably like, man, this is a lot of work. I don't know how I can do this in this city. Man, this city was messed up. And he's going, I don't know how I can jump into this. And so God speaks to him in Acts chapter 18, verse 9 and 10. He says this. He says, don't be afraid, but keep on speaking and don't be silent. For I am with you. Man, isn't that a promise that you'd like to hold on to? I'm with you. And no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you. Why? Because I have many people in this city. Church, I'm telling you, God is already at work in this city. He's just acting, asking us to come and join in the activity that he already has going on. And we get a chance to do that. So what I want to do today is give you a little bit of, of what I call a napkin sketch, um, idea of the mission and vision of our church family. We call it our Riverside Church family. That's one church in multiple locations in multiple languages. Right now in our chapel, we have a Spanish-speaking service that is going on. I just left our Journey Point location in Central Park. We are one church in multiple locations in multiple languages. Tonight, we'll have Riverside Indonesia happening as well, where they don't speak um, Southern white English like I do. <laughs> and so we get to kind of have this napkin sketch. When I say a napkin sketch, it's like, it's like an elevator pitch. If you're familiar with sales, you, you always try to have something ready so that if someone asks you the question, um, particularly like, hey, what is that church all about? right? So I'm a, I'm a pastor, right? And, and when I go out and engage with people in coffee shops or different places around the city, inevitably, uh, just like we do as Americans, we're like, hey, what's your name? Where are you from? And then what do we ask? What do you do? And, and I get to go, I'm a pastor and watch them respond because there's not a lot of pastors in Denver and a lot of people aren't familiar with them. And so a lot of times people say, well, man, what's your church all about? And so what I want to do today is like if someone's asking, maybe you engage with your neighbor, maybe a friend or a colleague or a coworker or a family member. They're like, well, what is Riverside all about? What is this church family all about? I want to give you just kind of a general overview of what we're about, who we are and what we are about. What's our mission, right? A mission or a mission statement that people have, that's like the compass, right? I had a compass a couple of weeks ago. I immediately gave that to one of my kids because I know I'd never use it again. And, and uh, um, we have a compass that guides us. The compass is what guides us to where we're trying to go, right? And so the mission statement of a church is the guiding piece that guides us to where God is calling us to go. And for us here with our Riverside Church family, our mission statement is this. We exist to lead people to live the Jesus life. We exist to lead people to live the Jesus life. Now, there was a day and age where like mission statements were like paragraphs long. No one knew them. You couldn't understand them. And you certainly couldn't reproduce them to anyone else, right? So today's day and age, a lot of the, the, the science and, and kind of data behind it says you need to make the mission statement memorable so that even, uh, they say a 12-year-old boy. I was a little offended that they didn't say a 12-year-old girl, but we know why they said a 12-year-old boy. Because we know girls are so smart and they can catch on to things and they have it, right? You ladies just, just crush us. But even it makes sense to them and they could reproduce it. And so we lead people to live the Jesus life. But as simple as that is, it has some, some breakdown to it that's a little bit more profound when you start to really dive in. We exist to lead people to live the Jesus life. Church, we don't exist just to exist. But we don't exist just to come and check a box and say we attended a service. We don't exist just to say that, oh yeah, I'm, I, that's awesome. But no, we exist to lead people. Do you know that a lot of people um, that lead have followers? <laughs> I know it seems profound, but do you also know that there are some people that consider themselves leaders but don't have any followers? I tell them often, you're, you're not a leader, you're just going out on a walk. 
You're not, no one's following you. You're just by yourself engaging, right? It means that we have others that we are engaged with that we are showing and setting an example for them to lead out. A common definition of leadership is inspiring a group of individuals towards achieving a common goal, guiding them from their current state to a desired destination. So if we exist to lead people to live the Jesus life, we are trying to take a group of people from their current state to a better destination. For us, that would be the Jesus life. We exist to lead people. It's just that. We exist to lead not just anyone, but people. Did you know that the building is not the church, but the people are? Did you know that the, the mission is not the church building, but the mission is the people? It's the souls made in the image of God. People are the mission. Not programs, not activities, not church buildings, not anything else. Guess what? Every church in the New Testament portion of the Bible is dead and gone. The people are the mission, not the building, not the program, not the activities, not those types of things. Not attendance numbers, but people, because we exist to lead people to live the Jesus life. And that's just it too. We exist people not to just be somewhere, but to live. The connotation of living means not dying, right? Or not just sitting stagnant. Living means alive and walking and growing and breathing, right? And, and, and we don't want to teach people to just know the Jesus life, people to just attend a program about the Jesus life, people to just understand there is a Jesus life, but we exist to lead people to actually live the Jesus life. That means that we look at them and say, are you, are you living the Jesus life? Do you know the man named Jesus and what he did for you? How is the Jesus life going in your own life? We don't want them to just know more. We want them to serve. We don't want them to just serve or even to make Denver just a better place to go to hell from. But we want them to live and experience the Jesus life. The Jesus life. We exist to lead people to live what? The Jesus life. Whether you're here today and you're processing your thoughts about Christianity, whether you're here today and you're a longtime follower of Jesus, whether you're here and you still don't trust that Jesus was who he said he was. The fact of the matter is there is no better life that we can point to than the life of Jesus that has been talked about for thousands of years. If we have an example of the way to live, Jesus was the example of the way to live. Even if you don't believe he is who he said he was, if you look at his life of compassion and mercy and grace and love and kindness, that's a life worth living. But I believe that he is who he said he was. He was the son of God. And that his death, burial, and resurrection gives me a right relationship with God forever in heaven. And so I want nothing more than to encounter people, engage with them, and lead them to live the Jesus life. Because he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. He is our metric. He is our goalpost in everything that we do. You don't want to live the Chris life, I promise you. It comes with a lot of heartache and too much sports. You don't want to live the Tim life. You don't want to live the Jim life. You don't want to live the John life. You don't want to live anybody else. You don't want to live the Janet life. You don't want to live the Janice life or the Karen life. There's some people that live the Karen life, we know. But you don't want to live the Karen life for sure or even Karen's life. You want to live the Jesus life. And if we do this, church, I promise you, we will see God work and move and accomplish the vision that he has for us. So if the, the mission statement is, is the, the guiding kind of function of guiding us to where we are going, where are we going? Well, we don't want to just be a church that exists and has services and does these things, but we really feel God is calling us specifically to do something in and through the life of our church family. And our vision for that, where we are going, is to be a catalyst for multiplication in Denver, the West, and the world. You've heard this multiple times. But I want to break it down as well, because as simplistic as it may seem, it's also deeper than just a statement. What is a catalyst? 
If we're going to be a catalyst for multiplication, what is a catalyst? A catalyst is a substance or agent that speeds up or facilitates a chemical reaction or change without itself undergoing a permanent change. So it's something that speeds up change in others without actually destroying itself. And we want to be catalysts for change. The mission of Jesus is calling us to be catalysts. God calls his people to speed up change, particularly in regards to multiplication. Our vision is to be a catalyst for multiplication. Did you know that Jesus was all about multiplication? Like in the lives of others around him, Jesus was multiplying his life. He was multiplying disciples. He was multiplying the church and so much more. Like the mission of Jesus given from God is still alive and active today because of his focus on multiplication. People making disciples that made disciples that made disciples that made disciples until it got here to September 24th, 2023 to you and I. He multiplied his life and his disciples and they went out and spread the gospel to the world so that we could have it here in Denver, Colorado. I am so grateful that God is a God of multiplication. Are you glad that God's a God of multiplication? And so we are called to be catalysts for multiplication. By the way, just not catalyst for multiplication, but it's got to be Denver, the West, and the world. If you're going to multiply anything, it starts right here. It starts with our people, and guess what? Our city needs it. You know this. Denver, I say this often, is 95% spiritually disconnected from Christ. Functionally, what that means is that when you walk out the door and go engage in the things that you're going to engage in this afternoon, that means that nine and a half out of 10 people that you come across while you're engaging in those things are spiritually disconnected from Christ and on their way to a Christless eternity. 95%. Do you know that in Denver, again, countless multiplication in Denver, there's only one evangelical church for every 32,000 people. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, where there's one evangelical church for every 400 people. I don't know about you, math is a little off. There's a rapid rise of people that moved into Denver and not a rapid rise of churches that moved in with them. They didn't move here to partake in church activities, if you know what I mean. Do you know that there's one marijuana dispensary for every 2,094 people in in the city of Denver? But one church for every 32,000 people. There's more dispensaries than McDonald's, Starbucks, and Walmarts combined in our city. If we do not start in our city, we are really missing the boat. This church has a history of that. At one point, there were multiple into the double digits of churches that they were a part of in and around the city. And I'm telling you what, God, it will get us back to doing work in and amongst this city because we have got to multiply ourselves in this City. That's why we're one church in multiplications in multiple languages. Here, check this out with me real quick. 95% of people are spiritually disconnected from Christ. But if we have five churches in our city, just five churches in our city that plant one church every three years, okay? Five churches planting one church every three years. We kind of look at that and say, oh, I don't know if it could be done. Our Journey Point location and now our Riverside location has taken part in the last three years of planting out one in Arvada, and next year we will send out our second one just in four years. It can be done if it's a focus. But if we plant one church every three years, there's five of those in the city that are doing that, and they reach just 250 people. 250 people, which in a room that has 2,500 seats, that doesn't feel like a lot, but the average church in America is about 86 people. So if you have five churches planting one church every three years and those churches never reach more than 250 people, do you know that we would impact the percentage of lostness or those spiritually disconnected from Christ by 25 to 32% in 30 years? That's what I'm here for. I'm not here to just make Denver a better place to go to hell from, but I'm here to impact those people that have not yet given their life to Jesus Christ. And guess what? Our vision isn't just be a catalyst here in Denver, but also the West. Did you know that the Western part of the United States, if you remove it from the rest of the United States, is the fourth most lost country in the world? China, India, and Indonesia are one, two, and three, and then the Western U.S. I'm not going to say it's because of the Californians, because there's too many in the room. Just kidding. That is a joke. 
But the Western part of the United States is the fourth most lost country in the world. But guess what? If we can multiply what God is doing here, being catalyst for multiplication in Denver, I guarantee you it will happen in the Western part of the U.S. as well. That's why next year we're going to engage with church planters and church people that are starting churches in Los Angeles as well as Seattle. We're going to go there and help them do what God is calling us to do, to be a catalyst for multiplication in Denver, in the West. And then guess what? If we do that, we will probably also go to the world. Not only is the world coming to Denver, but Denver is also going to the world. In a couple of weeks, Pastor Tim and I are going to be in London engaging with people that are starting churches in London. You think Denver has a uniqueness in those spirits who are disconnected from Christ. London is ahead of us. So not only can we learn from them, but we can help them start the work that God is calling them to do in their city. India, we have our Indonesian fellowship. They go and take trips a couple of times a year to engage with people over there. I've been asked to help start a, um, a, an assessment for people that start churches, church planters in Uganda. I guarantee you the one thing that we will be known for more than anything else is being a catalyst for multiplication in Denver, the West, and the world because that's what God is calling us to do. It's all in the scriptures. And speaking of scriptures, here at our Riverside Church family, we have three key verses that kind of our staff team talk about more than anything else. These are three key verses that when we look through the lens of the things that we are doing and trying to join in God's activity in the city, these are the verses that we think about, that we talk about, that we kind of throw things up against the wall with these three scriptures. Some of you that have a church background, you're very familiar with them. If you're new to the Bible, they are key scriptures in the Bible that any church should adhere to, but that we are going all in with. The first one is Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Some of you know this as the great... Commission. Think about that, the commission. That means that we are on mission together. We are collaborating on mission together. This is the great mission that we have together that Jesus gives his followers. And so in the great commission, we see this. It says this in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 28. It says, the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. I like how simple that is. It's like, hey, Jesus told me to go here and guess what? They went there. I'm pretty sure if I saw his death, burial, and resurrection, I'd go wherever he said to. Matter of fact, Libby and I are in Denver, Colorado because of God's call on our life to come here. When God says go, guess what you better do? Get up and go. And he says they go to this mountain where he directed them. And then it says when they saw him, this group of people, these followers of his, a couple of hundred that are here, it says they worshiped, praise God. I don't know if they had like guitars and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if they were singing hymns. They weren't around yet. They were probably singing the Psalms, right? But they were worshiping him. They were praying. They were crying out. They were grateful to see him. But guess what also was there? There was some doubt. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. If you're here today and you've ever had doubts, you're in good company. This is a safe place. We don't think that we're better than anybody else, that we have it all together and that we don't have doubts on our own. The same ones that saw Jesus raised from the dead, not only some worshiped, but some also still doubted. And it's okay, it's not okay to sit there, but it's okay to be there. And I love what Jesus does here in verse 18. It says, Jesus came near to them. Can't you just see him kind of like, I don't know if he does this, it doesn't say, it's not clear, but I'm thinking he goes straight to the doubters. And he just leans in a little bit. In a loving, compassionate, kind, and caring way, he just leans in and he tells him this. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I don't know what king of this earth you are worshiping. I don't know who you think has control and power and who has to be in what seat to do whatever. But I'm going to tell you this right now. Jesus Christ has all authority given to him in heaven and on earth. That's it. There's no one else that has the authority that Jesus has. He says, all authority has been given to me from my father in heaven and on earth. And because of that, he tells them, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy Spirit. Did you catch that? He said, make disciples, but also baptizing. 
Some people, they say, well, it's all about what we know and how we learn to love and dr- grow in our relationship with Jesus. And it's this. It's, it's tell me more, teach me more, let me walk more, let me attend more classes, let me do these things, teach this way, do this way, do this thing. No, 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 the knowledge, the knowledge, the knowledge. The more I know, the better I am. That's certainly part of our walk, our, our walk and our work with the Lord. But guess what? He also says, and baptizing, which means that If what we know doesn't lead to us telling people about who Jesus is, then we really don't know what we think we know. And so if you're in a boat and you have some oars, right? Making disciples is an oar. Evangelism is an oar. Walking with people in their relationship with God is an oar. Engaging with people that do not yet know God is an oar. And guess what? If you don't have one of those oars, you're rowing in circles. You're over here, you're just rowing in circles. And if you're only over here, you're just rowing in circles. And Jesus says it's about both. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And guess what he says here? I don't like this next part. I'm just gonna be honest with you. He says, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. You know what that means? You're not just teaching them to know, you're not just teaching them to understand, but you're teaching them by showing them with your own life. One would maybe say you're living the Jesus life in a way that shows them how to live the Jesus life. Teaching them to observe, to see you living according to my word in your own life. Yikes, he got personal. He went to meddling, didn't he? And then he says, if you do this, remember I am with you always to the end of the age. You go, you make disciples, you reach people far from God, you understand the gospel came to you on its way to someone else, and guess what? I am with you. That's a promise from Jesus that he is with us when we engage in this. With you always, he says. And guess what happens? He's talking to these people, some that were worshiping, some that were doubting. And you know what? He's telling them what to do. And you know what they did? They went and did it. He said, got up and go. They got up and went. And and, and that comes to our second key verse, which is out of Acts chapter two, verse 42 through 47. This is like the Acts is the New Testament. This is like even in the beginning of Acts in Acts chapter one, this is like right after Jesus is given the great commission. And then it goes into what these people are doing. And we see people coming to know Christ in mass numbers because they're doing what Jesus commanded them to do. And in chapter two, verse 42, it says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Think about this word devoted. We have a lot of devoted people to a lot of devoted things. I may step on some toes here. And listen, I'm a Colorado Buffs fan. The devoted people watched that whole game yesterday, right? You could have turned it off like at the end of the first quarter. Certainly before halftime, you knew it wasn't gonna change. But the devoted people were there. We have some people that the 0-2 Broncos, we're still holding out that we're gonna beat one of the best teams in the league today with the Dolphins. And listen, I'm there. I want them to win. But like realistically, I'm like, am I that devoted to go watch that game? Sadly, I am, <laughs> but, but they're devoted. What were they devoted to? Teaching, fellowship, communion, or breaking of bread and prayer. It says, everyone was filled with awe. Many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Verse 44 says, now all the believers were together and held all things in common. This is how you knew it was an act of God because a group of people were together and they held everything in common. That's not easy to do even with your closest friend groups. And it says that they had all thing, were, were together and held all things in common. They were devoted. They weren't devoted to watching Netflix. They weren't devoted to watching sports. They weren't devoted to the art scene. They weren't devoted to playing music. They weren't devoted to listening to music. They were devoted to the things of God. And look what God does. In verse 45, it says, they sold all their possessions and their property and distributed to the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, if you're like me, you're looking to the caveat as like, as any had need that was rightly justified, right? As any had need that they had their life in order and were doing those things. As any had need that they weren't just trying to get a quick buck and they didn't want to have a job or whatever else, right? Isn't that the way we live in America now? Oh, I'll give to you, but what are you going to do? Do I trust that you're going to do that with this? 
No, 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 no. It says they sold their possessions on Facebook marketplace, distributed it and the proceeds to all as any had need. And then it says every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. These are relationships here, church. They ate food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all people. It didn't say they devoted themselves to what they wanted to do, to their own desires, to the things they wanted to watch, to the things that they liked, to the books that they wanted to read. But no, they devoted themselves to meeting together, being with one another. These are life-changing relationships that they had with one another. They're praising God and eating with sincere hearts. And then it says, every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. I don't think there's any misconception here that when you have a group of people devoted to the things of God, other people want to be devoted to that same thing. If you're looking at your relationship with the Lord and you're wondering why no one wants to have a relationship with the Lord, maybe some of the questions that we need to ask in the first place is, does my relationship with the Lord look desirable for anybody else? Or does it look like just anything else the world is doing? Do I look devoted enough to the Lord that anybody else would be? I want that because he's devoted to it. They devoted themselves to the Lord. Every day, the Lord's adding to the number of those who were being saved. And then last kind of key passage for us is out of Luke chapter 15. And this is one of my favorite scriptures because it makes no sense to me at all in terms of what happens and transpires here. Number one, it says that Jesus is sitting here. It says, all the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Like the Pharisees and scribes, they're like the, um, what we today would call legalistic people, right? They're adding the things to it. They wanted Jesus not to be the Messiah, but they're saying he can't be the Messiah because he needed to do these extra additional things, right? In, in the church world, we say that we are legalistic if we're like, hey, the word is not good enough. You gotta do all these other things on top of the word in order to be living the Jesus life correctly in my way and the way that I think it needs to be happen. Yet they had Jesus in front of them and they didn't even know him as the savior of the world. But it's crazy because he's eating with them, Pharisees and scribes, but also tax collectors and sinners. I was trying to wrap my mind around that this week. And I was like, all right, what, what is like, what would that look like, right? And the only thing I can look at with this, and just bear with me, I'm not getting like political, but like we're going into 2024, which I don't know if you know this, is a, a, is a political election year. Um, it's just a new thing. I know there's not been much about it on the news or anything like that. But, but it, I, I imagine like, this is Jesus sitting down with independents, with Democrats, and with Republicans. And he's like, you know what? Let's talk about something, something non-controversial or anything else. Let's talk about politics and religion. It's Thanksgiving. Let's just hang out, have a good conversation about politics and religion with the family here. This is who's in this room. And it says, so he told him this parable. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? Can I be honest with you? Makes no sense whatsoever. Like if you're in logistics or anything like that, that's just like a logistical tragedy, right? That's just like a logistical, logistical write-off, if you will. If you have a truck and there's a hundred things on it and just one thing goes, you're kind of like, hey, insurance is paying for that. I'm not going after it. I got 99 left to get to where I need to go to, right? It don't make any sense at all. But Jesus says, not only does it make sense, but it says that who, like who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the one until when? Until he gets tired, until he doesn't want to look anymore? No, until he finds it. When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. And coming home, he calls his friends and his neighbors together, saying with them, rejoice with me because I've found the lost sheep like they're probably thinking, you got 99 over here, man. And then he says, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. So that makes no sense at all to anybody until you, you know when? You know when that makes sense? When you realize that you're the one sheep lost open out in the field. Jesus running after the one makes zero sense to anybody until you put yourself in the place of that one sheep and understand that Jesus comes running hard after you. That's when it makes sense. And so these verses, they're key to everything that we do. It's a reminder of what God's called us to do and how he's called us to accomplish it. 
by living according to the Great Commission, by living according to what happened in the Church of Acts with the people and the one and others together, and by understanding that Jesus is running hard after those that do not yet know him, and that heaven is rejoicing when one of them comes to know him. And so I've just kind of titled this as like how we work. So it makes up a, a little bit of how we work. And we have this slide that's kind of put together that kind of puts this a little bit on a, on a, a visual piece for you. Um, my wife is a very visual learner, um, a very visual person, which stinks because she has to look at me all the time. So pray for her. And, um, but she's a visual learner. And so if we, we have this at the top, at the top of what we have, this is like our Great Commission engine. This is language that we use internally. We will probably only tell this once every couple of years or whatever that is. But this Great Commission engine is like, hey, this is the engine that's going to drive what God is calling us to do. And in the middle of that engine is the one it being greater than the 99. Like we have to understand that if this is what Jesus is saying is greater, like the one being greater than the 99 is what we run after. And so in the, the three kind of uh, pistons, if you will, in this engine is, is our catalytic weekend experience. Like we want this thing in here to be fun. Well, we want it to be life-giving. We don't want you to leave going, well, I checked another box. But we want it to be like life-giving, this experience that you go, man, I want some more and I want to invite my friends and neighbors into that. Dude on stage is a little weird, wears too much Lululemon and Nikes, but like, okay, it's cool. All the other people are all right. And if we do that, then I think we can form and create some life-changing relationships like we see in the book of Acts. Like, I don't want you to just know people in here. I want there to be life-changing relationships in here with the people sitting next to you. And if we do that and we have some people that are helping us change our lives and focus on living the Jesus life, I guarantee you we'll have some surrendered living that's what they were doing in Acts, selling their possessions, distributing proceeds as all had and any had need. Like it's there, right? And then by the way, any engine, I'm not gonna go with the electric engines right now because I don't have one. And honestly, I'm just a little bitter. I kind of want one, but I don't have one yet. So we're just gonna go with the fuel engine, okay? And so for those of you that, that have electric cars, just bear with me. The fuel engine, there's only one thing that is going to, to keep that car going and that's gasoline, right? And the gasoline that keeps our engine running here is prayer in the Holy Spirit. These people, when you look at them in Acts, they were praying together. They were watching the Holy Spirit do the work. And so if we're gonna do or accomplish this, it's gonna be done with prayer and the Holy Spirit. And so let me give you just a couple of examples of what each one of those look like. So when we look at ga uh, catalytic gatherings, what do you mean by catalytic gatherings, Chris? Well, with catalytic gatherings, we mean things like our weekend, ex our, our weekend gatherings, our weekend experience, our here, this morning. We're also gonna be starting a prayer gathering. We're gonna start it once a week. We're just gonna uh, find the best time that we can and once a week, we're gonna be dedicated to coming in and praying. I had somebody ask me, they're like, okay, what's that gonna look like? What are you gonna be doing during that prayer time? And I was like, praying. This is like, nah, it's very simple. We're just gonna pray. We're gonna have a little bit of worship. It actually may be worship over music, over the speakers, or it may be live, but it's not gonna be the focus. We're just gonna come in and pray, asking God to do what only he can. And we're gonna do that once a week and we're gonna be dedicated and committed to it. And I want you to be dedicated and committed to it. We have things like the porch. You've heard us say this out there. We have a Denver West World sign out there. That's what we're transforming into something we call the porch. That means if you have not engaged with anybody from our team or myself, the one thing that we want you to do before you leave or before you do anything else here is to come to the porch and get to know somebody on our team. I just wanna connect so that you can begin in life-changing relationships. And then another thing actually starting next Sunday after service is called the after party. We couldn't come up with a better name, but I was like, man, it's after service and I want it to be a party. So it's the after party, right? And so we're gonna go in there and we're gonna find out a little bit more about what the church is about and how you can get connected to serving and getting connected to one another. Those are our catalytic gathering type of things that we want to do. But then we also have life-changing relationships. And in our life-changing relationships, what do we mean? Adam mentioned it. We have Alpha we got to baptize several people from our last Alpha group and our kind of um, uh, our, our test model of it. And so we're running Alpha again, beginning this Thursday. And by the way, Alpha is not just for those that are not followers of Jesus. Alpha is for those that are going, man, like I need to find ways to answer some of the hard questions of God. Like why would a good God allow suffering? And I need to have a safe space to do it. And Alpha is that safe space to walk through, whether you're a follower of Jesus or you're not a follower of Jesus, a safe space to walk through some really hard questions of the faith. We have things like connect groups, some of those meet here at Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. Some of those meet in homes. Some of those meet throughout the week. Alpha is kind of like a connect group in that regard. But connect groups is where you, guess what? Connect. Again, we're really simplistic here. Also, I'm just not creative. And so it's like, this is a connect group. 
Our goal is just to get you to connect with one another so that you can hold each other accountable and walk through the same stage of life with someone else. Some of our, our, our senior connect groups, you could pray for Stephanie. Stephanie is on an eight day trip with about 37 seniors this week. She needs lots of prayer. I'll let you take that for what it's worth. They're going to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky and, and up around the Cincinnati area. And so that's a group of people like, hey, they're going and doing that, right? We love our senior groups that go and do that. We have activity groups. Like if you like to run, hey, start an activity group. If you do something, like we play basketball on Wednesday nights in the gym. Like we want to have activities. Like if your activity is, is watching the Broncos, like invite other people over. Misery loves company. I knew that would hit pretty well. O and two is just tough. I'm in and I'm for them, but it's tough right now. But whatever your activity is, whether it's working out or running or doing whatever, like we want to have those activity groups going. The last but certainly not least in the groups is D groups. These are disciple making groups. These are typically men meeting with men, ladies meeting with ladies and diving deeper into the word of God, the doctrines of God, the important things of the faith that we can dive into a little bit more. Those are our life-changing relationships. We know that life-changing relationships will happen in there. And then last, but certainly not least in this regard is the surrendered living. We want you to live surrendered lives to Jesus because that's the Jesus life. That's what we see in the book of Acts. This means that you're praying, you're serving, you're giving back to God what is rightfully his through the local church. That means that we engage in things like church planting and multiplication. Like we let guys like Bryson come in and, and begin to build his team and launch his church because we need more churches, not just bigger churches. That means that we're engaged in multiplication. That means that we work with GenSend, our Gen Senders that come in the summer and do GenSen semesters and apprentices, and t- internship programs. We want to engage with people so that we can raise up, build up, train, equip, and mobilize missionaries to go out to Denver, the West, and the world. That's gonna happen when we're living surrendered lives. And I wanna tell you something, all of that is only true and going to be true if we focus on this last part, which is the center of everything. And that's who's your one. Understanding Luke 15, that the one is greater than the 99 according to Jesus. And so we want this to become such common terminology that it's like, hey, Pastor Chris, will you pray for my one? Will you pray for my one? Man, they're right on the edge of coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Would you, man, can I introduce you to my one? My one is, I wanna, hey, this is my one. Hey, here's my one. They're walking through and struggling some things. Would you get some coffee with the one? Hey, how's your one? Who are you engaging with? And we need to hold each other accountable. Hey, who's your one that I can be praying for? Who's your one that you're trying to engage with? Where are you going to get engaged with your one? We want that to become common vernacular here so that we can see heaven rejoicing over those that give their lives to Christ. Did you know that in this year, we've baptized almost 30 people, and in our downtown location here, that's nearly, that's nearly the same amount of people in the last five years that we've baptized just this year. That really deserved like an amen. Here's what, I, we've baptized 30 people this year, so far, right at 30 people. That's more than the last five years combined. And it's not because of me, it's not because of Pastor Tim, it's not because of anybody else, it's because we're running after the ones and joining in the activity that God is doing out in the city. And that's what God is calling us to do. And it will only happen, not because of me, not because of anybody on our team, quite frankly, not because of any of you all as well, even though I love you and you're a vital part of it. It will only come through prayer and the Holy Spirit. That's it. It's prayer and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is clear, says the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, so get a bunch of people to do some stuff. No, it says, so pray to the Lord of the harvest and he will send his harvest workers. Prayer in the Holy Spirit will fuel all that we do. So as Hunter and the team get ready to come up here, you may ask the question, why does a church mission like this matter, Chris? Why would you take one Sunday to do what you just did? Because did you know that God's plan for a hopeless and broken world is the local church. That's his plan for the world. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. He came to multiply himself in the life of other other people. And church is not a building. Church is not a name. Church is the people. And the hope for a broken and hurting world is the local church. I firmly believe that the The more thriving the local church is, the more thriving our Riverside Church family is, the more more settled Denver will be in who they're called to be. 
the purpose that God has for their life and the better our city will be. The better our churches are, the better our city will be. So why would we do this? Because God sent his only son to die a death he didn't deserve, to be put on a cross he didn't deserve to be on, to be buried in a tomb, to be raised on the third day so that you and I can sit here today and know that the hope for a broken and lost world is the local church. And he's asking you to join in that activity. And so I hope and pray that when you're like, man, what's this church all about? Who are these people and what are they doing why is that guy wearing Lululemons and Nikes so much? Why does he talk about it? It's because the hope for Denver, Colorado, for the Western United States and around the world is the local church. There's nothing that brings me greater joy than the local church. Nothing. Nothing. So my question to you as we respond back to God's word here through worship is where are you going and what map are you using? Where are you going and what map are you using? I'm telling you, we have a map that we would love for you to come alongside and walk with us. And I hope and pray that it is life-giving to you, that the the weekend experience is just catalytic. It's just change agent that sends you out into your workplaces and your neighborhoods and gets you excited about talking about the things of God and that it brings life-changing relationships with you in so many different ways and avenues that you're devoted with those people to do the things of God and that you are living a surrendered life. You are taking up your cross daily and walking with Jesus and that you are leading people to live the Jesus life. And my hope and prayer for every single one of you is that you would lean in and that you would say, where, where is my part? And how can, how can, where can I get started? Where can I go? What can we do? I promise you over the next four weeks, we're going to be doing that. We're going to be talking about encountering Jesus and growing together and discovering our purpose and then impacting others. My hope and my prayer is that you would join in to these distinctives, these discipleship distinctives that are key to us. But more than anything else, if you're here this morning or you are watching online, my hope and prayer would be an answered prayer to what I've been asking God to do, which is bring people into this church that do not yet know Jesus as Lord and Savior and that they would have the conviction, the confidence and boldness to say yes to following Jesus. That they would believe in his death, his burial and his resurrection, that they would trust in him with their life, that they would ask him to forgive them of their sin that put him on the cross in the first place. They would believe that that faithfulness to forgive is there and that they would say yes to him leading their life and that their life would be forever changed because we understood that the gospel came to us on its way to someone else. So my hope and prayer for you today, if that is you, is that you would say yes to following Jesus and that you would look around the room and find others that are wanting, wanting desperately to walk alongside of you. Where are you going and what map are you using?